great song, what a great prayer, that we would dwell with the Lord forever. Isn't it unique? I always think about this when we're worshiping, that we, um, you know, music moves us in certain ways when we play songs, but do you ever notice when we come into worship how one day you have a certain sense of what's happening and feeling of what's happening and then other days different? But isn't it interesting how when the presence of the Lord there, there's such a, a community, a, a, a group feeling. Like when we came to worship, how many of you, and we began to sing, how many of you just sense just a unique presence of the Spirit this morning happening, right? And you could just tell. It was like God's moving and, and working in lives in different ways. And uh, I, I think that's continuing. I, I'm going to go into the Scriptures this morning. But then right on the heels of that, and so I'll let the worship team know in advance, I want to go back to the song that we sang, kind of finishing up, and then you'll go into, I know you've got another closing song, but just an opportunity um, to transition, because I, I want us to acknowledge the presence of the Lord, and that He's still moving and working in our midst, and then in our response time as well. What I'm talking about this morning, I'm, I'm actually... Um, beginning a, how do I describe this? So this is the intro to a large series that will give way to multiple smaller series. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is about building a life of faith that remains. Right? And we're going to be talking about this idea over the coming months, not just weeks, coming months. As a church, we have folks who are of different generations. Not only different generations numerically in terms of moments of time, right? The, you know, the silent generation, the, the boomers, the Xers, millennials, Gen Z, right? And, and on. We, we, we have that generationally, but we also have people who are of different faith generations. And so those are marked by different characteristics as well. Different things that one generation of disciples of Jesus have experienced or are experiencing versus another generation. And, and so when we began, we, we talked about, uh, I get together with a group and we talk about what's the Lord saying to us as a church? What's he saying to the church, capital C? What's he saying in our community? Um, what's he saying to you personally? So we ask some of these questions and we say, so what things out of the scriptures, what things do the scriptures address in our lives, in the world around us, and where we're at as a church, and how do we want to go about forming uh, messages? So, of course, there are different messages that come up, just pop up during the year, they're not part of a series, it's just, you know, I feel like the Spirit's saying this, I feel like God's leading us in this, but we also have what educators might call, they call it scope and sequence, like, if we want to get to point the, the end point, letter C or D, we got to start with A and we have to connect it. And we have to kind of move through, right? So I, I'm just kind of telling you, why are we talking about this? What does it, why are we talking about building a life of faith that remains? Here's, here's the challenge, is that we have different generations in different places, but we're all still growing, right? We're all still building. But we're not all starting from the same place, and we're also not coming with the same background of where we're figuring this out, of how to grow up in Jesus. And, and so sometimes what happens in, in a family, and I'll refer to us as a family, is that one comes from this side, and the other comes from the other side, and it's different generationally, and they're facing different things, and there becomes this, like, you're not speaking my language. <laughs> we're not, we're, how is it that we're in the same family, and we long for the same things, but we're just missing each other. It seems like you're talking about one thing and it doesn't really apply. And the, the reality is because we're in different places and different seasons of life. And we're facing different challenges. And yet, the scriptures have something to say to all of us. Now, when we talk about building a life uh, of faith that remains, some of you may say, you know, Quite honestly, Pastor Andy, I've been following the Lord for 60 years. You know, I've been following the Lord for decades now. This seems kind of odd that you're going to just go back. 
So you're just speaking to those who are new in Christ, right? That's, this is, and I'm just going to have to endure all these messages, you know, because they're for somebody else. They're not going to apply to me. The, the truth is that they're going to apply to all of us at different places of where we're at in our walk with Christ, and they're going to challenge us to look at where we're at in this moment of time and how do we grow together. So this house that I'm alluding to is your personal life, building your own house of faith, but it also has to do with how do we build this house together. This house of faith, this house of God, this, this community of faith, how do we build this together? If you were thinking of it in terms of your own family, you wouldn't say, well, here's my room, and I know what I'm putting in that, and I like shack carpet, I like, you know, uh, to go back mid-century modern stuff too, so I'm going to decorate it that way. And then the person over here goes, oh no, I like ultra-modern. I want everything black, and I want, you know, and everybody just kind of picks their own thing. You kind of have a weird house, right? A little bit, if you're on extremes in every room, you go, well, that's good for you, but we're doing this together, right? We, we want this to be a reflection, not just of you individually, but us together. And so this is part of what I'm talking about. How do we grow together and build this together? Because we want to mutually edify and lift up one another, as the scripture says. So in this way, this is important to me, because in this way, the church is about you, because you're part of the church. And when I use this word church, I don't speak organizationally. There's the organization. I speak about the body of Christ. You are part of the body of Christ if you're a follower of Jesus. So the church is about you. But it's not all about you. It's not all about you. In our consumer world, in our consumer culture, it would say it's all about you. And if it doesn't meet you, then out the door you go because that message or that ministry didn't meet you. But in the scriptures, the way that the Bible talks about the body of Christ, it's about us. So when it says, you, you are the body of Christ, we've talked about this before, it's better if you say it kind of with a, a southern or, or Texas apostrophe. It's not just, you are the body of Christ, it's y'all are the body of Christ, right? So that's what it's saying is, Y'all are the body of Christ. You are, but it's all of you together. It's all of us together. So we're building this life. We're building a faith that remains all together. So I want us to pray. We're going to look at Matthew 7. And this is an opening message to this broader series. We'll come back next week, and I'll focus in a little bit more. We're going to start into the parables of the kingdom. And we'll be doing a few messages that really focus in on the parables of the kingdom. But I want us to get this bigger idea of why are we going through this? What are we attempting to do? Well, we're attempting to build a house. And we're going to start on some foundational pieces. And then we're going to frame it. And then we're going to do some finish work with drywall. And, and then we're going to add in and just go through the whole process until the last we're, we're furnishing it. We're putting some specific pieces in. And so next week we'll be going into parables of the kingdom. What are some foundational points that scripture has to talk about? We're going we're gonna to build this together. You guys up for building a house together? All right, to do this together? All right, Jesus, we thank you so much for your word that it gives us a firm foundation to stand on. Thank you that you are, Lord, building up within us your kingdom. That it's not just something we're putting our hand to externally that will wash away and waste away. But Lord, we are applying ourselves to the building up of a faith that remains in you. Both for ourselves, but also for those around us. So thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're with us personally. But thank you, God, that you've put us in a family. You've put us in a community of others who long and desire and and work at the same thing, to see us grow up in you, to see us commit to life together in you. 
that we might live it to the full. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Matthew 7, 21 to, to 23. I should say, incidentally, this, this hits very close to home. I've been working on a home improvement project. I tend to always be working on some home improvement project, but right now I'm working on a master bath. Uh, always fin Already finished the, the other bathroom. Um, but I've been working on this master bath. It's just been a year and a half, so it's fine. It's fine. It'll get done. Eventually, it'll, it'll get done. Using the word working very loosely, right? Air quotes. Working on it. So when we talk about building, like I'm, I'm all in on this. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This, this passage, there's, there's a handful of passages in the Gospels, particularly that Jesus is speaking, and uh, some of them are just retelling of the same encounter but these particular passages, they tend to freak people out. But this is one of them. Like They're like, wait, these people are saying, Lord, Lord. So they're acknowledging Jesus, and yet Jesus says, depart from me. So it tends to strike fear in people. Like, what do you mean? Like, I could have prayed the prayer, and like I could, I could be a Christian, and yet Jesus just gets to say arbitrarily, like, I didn't know you, out the door, you know, you go to hell. And so it strikes this deep concern in people and this insecurity about their lives. Like, I don't know the rules. How do I know I'm, how do I write the term, how do I know I'm saved? This is, this is what it comes, comes down to. But here's, here's the difference. This is what I want to highlight. People aren't missing the kingdom because they lack knowledge about Jesus. They miss out because he doesn't know them. Interesting, right? Jesus is using relational terms here. <coughs> Jesus talking about those who miss out on the kingdom, they're saying, Lord, Lord, did we not do these things? And Jesus' response to them is, I didn't know you. We don't have relationship. Like, you may have been doing stuff, but you never took the time to know me. We, we, we don't sit together. We don't talk. You do your thing, not the will of the Father. You do your thing, and you use my name to accomplish your purposes, but I don't know you. Do you know this actually happens in the church? People use Jesus' name to accomplish their things. In fact, I remember a pastor who once, once said, you go back, uh, you turn the pages from Matthew back to Matthew 28, where Jesus gives the Great Commission. He says, therefore, go and make disciples, right, of all nations, I'll be with you, uh, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and so this pastor was saying, you know, isn't that risky? Isn't that a great risk that Jesus makes? He says, go in my name and do these things. How many of you would commission somebody to use your name and your authority to go do stuff? Anybody raise their hand for that one? <laughs> and, and Jesus... You know, it's interesting, he doesn't put a lot of parameters around it. In fact, at one point, the disciples call out, this is before the crucifixion, the resurrection, they're ministering, and they notice somebody else, some others, who are doing things in Jesus' name. And they say, hey, wait, 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 these guys aren't with us. They're kind of apart from us. And Jesus goes, hey, it's, it, it's okay, in, in essence. He's like, it'll get worked out. He seems pretty comfortable with people using his authority in his name. But what he's talking about is like, don't worry about it. It's because it's up to him to determine who he knows and who he doesn't know in the end. This is important for us that we don't say, that's not legit, that's not legit. There are things that I've observed in my time with Jesus, ministries and ministers that I've gone if I was Jesus, I'd be pulling the rug out from that one right away. Like, why is that like happening? And yet, and yet, people 
are healed, people come to faith, people do different things. And, like, I want to start pulling out the weeds among the wheat right now. Like, let's get it all perfect and cleaned up. And Jesus says, you know what, it's going to grow up. And there's going to be stuff intermixed between what's good and what's bad. There's good fish, there's bad fish. It's all going to get it sorted. I know I'm using all of Jesus' analogies, right, his parables together. But this is, in essence, Jesus saying, like, it's not up to you to, to label it good and bad, good, bad, this stops this. He says, I give my name, I give my authority, and he goes, I'll figure it out at the end. I'll tell you the ones who are with me and those the ones who didn't know me at all and were just using my name, using my authority, and they weren't doing the Father's will, they were doing their will and their own purposes. They were using it for their glory instead of my glory. And we really have no relationship. This is challenging for me. Sometimes I think it's probably challenging for you. And we want to say, now, we should use discernment. Yeah, I'm not saying don't use discernment. I'm not saying, you know, be cautious about the teachings that are going on and, and propping up things. I'm just saying Jesus gives us a fair amount of room. But what he's focused on is, does he know you? Do you have a relationship with him? Are you using his name but not in relationship with him? Because if you know him and you recognize his presence, like this morning as we're worshiping and you're going, okay, or maybe not just this morning, but another time you go, I recognize the presence of Jesus. I recognize the heart of God for me. I actually sense his spirit at work within me. There's, there's no fear in that. Like if you were to ask me, Pastor, are you afraid that you're not going to make it into the kingdom? I would say, I have great reverence and great awe, and I want to be humble and continue to pursue Christ, but I have great assurance in God's ability to carry me through. I'm not fearful. I'm greatly confident in the work of the Spirit. So long as I continue to walk in the way of the Spirit and the heart of Christ, I have great confidence that He will welcome me in by His grace. Not because of my works, but by his grace, if I abide in him and keep, keep with him. And so should you. That's not just because I'm a pastor, but as a follower of Jesus, you should not read something like this and be fearful. I'm going to get to the presence of God and before the throne and stand in judgment, and I'm just going to be shocked. He's going to go, I never knew you. That's, that's not the way this happens. These are people who stood on their accolades. Did we not do all these great things? And Jesus says, you did a lot of stuff, but I never knew you. People aren't missing the kingdom because they lack knowledge about Jesus. They miss out because they don't. He doesn't know them. Matthew 7, 24 to 27, Jesus says, therefore, therefore, in response to this, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus is making a distinction in this section that he does throughout the gospel between the crowds that hear and the disciples who follow. The crowds hear the words of Jesus, but his disciples put his teachings into practice. This is how Jesus is differentiating between those he knows and those he doesn't know. He's saying, if you hear my words and you're putting them into practice, I know you. You're following me. We have this reciprocating relationship. There's another place where Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats. And the same kind of scenario. The people go, Lord, Lord, you know, how, how is it? How is it that we, we, you don't know us? And Jesus said, well, I came and knocked on your door and, and you didn't reply. I was in prison. You didn't visit me. I was hungry and you never fed me, right? He's giving all this list of things that they could have done that would have been in relationship to him. And he said, depart from me. 
You never did anything of the kingdom, of what my heart is in the kingdom. You just live life on your terms. So again, Jesus is making this contrast between crowds of people who hear his teachings and live life on their terms. They don't live on the way of Jesus. They don't disciple with Jesus. They hear his words and just kind of do life on their terms. And Jesus says, I don't know those people. They're not with me. They're, they're not following me. They're not putting into practice what I'm teaching. Here's where it can be challenging for us, especially when we think about from generation to generation, is that Jesus' words are the same yesterday, today, and forever. But how we put them into practice changes according to the context of our life. Jesus, when he's speaking, we can go to the Gospels and we can read the Gospels, we can read uh, Paul's writings, his letters, we can read Luke's account um, uh, of Jesus' life, and we can read the book of Acts from Luke as well. So we can read the scriptures. Isn't it interesting how one person, not just because of the Spirit, but because of their upbringing, sees one thing and another will see another. And the tendency is to create a conflict within the body of Christ because of the way that we see it and the experience, our own personal experience of, of what we've walked through. So even though Jesus' words are the same, Scripture is the same, and we're not trying to bend it, we're not trying to manipulate it, we're not trying to get Jesus to say something or the Bible to say something that it doesn't say. What we're trying to do is say, let's take a step back for a moment. If we're going to build a house of faith together, Let's actually listen to each other and say, what's the context in which you're trying to apply this and live this out? And let me share with you my context and my experience of having lived this out. And let's grow up together with this. Let's learn from each other and let's help each other understand how we're trying to do this. This is really important that we take this type of approach because otherwise we get into generational warfare with one another. And we say, well, it was, ne it was never that difficult when, it was, when I was growing up and doing it this way. And it's like, okay, that's good. That's good to hear. That's good to hear your experience. But here's what it's like for me. And here's what I'm experiencing. And then on the other side of that, you could say, well, you don't know anything what it's like to live in this context. And it's like, well, Actually, I do. I had some challenges and things I faced when I was going through. They're not exactly the same, but yeah, they, there were some difficulties that I faced. And so when you're building up a house of faith together, it really takes good listening, doesn't it? Have any of you gone through the process of building a home? Anybody have that experience? A few handful of hands up. Was it just easy? I mean, in everything, you just agreed with the other person, and I see a lot of heads being shaken. No. No, it was not easy. That's with somebody that you're living with who generally sees a lot of things the same way that you see them, and yet, even in that scenario, you found it difficult to agree on the way to put this thing together. Can you imagine how much more challenging it is for us, as we talk about building up one another in the faith, to not be judgmental towards one another, to not be overly critical about one another, or to just be simplistic and tell the other person, well, this is all you have to do, or the other way, just to say, well, you don't understand, right? The volley of these insults back and, back and forth, instead of sitting with each other, listening to each other, and saying, how do we do this? How do I build you up? How can you build me up? How can we together grow this life of faith together? Luke 5, Jesus has been ministering, all, and, and it's early on in Luke's gospel, and so Jesus has been ministering, and, and the religious leaders of the day are seeing a contrast with what Jesus is doing with what their experience has been. So Jesus is healing people, uh, he's calling the disciples, he's doing different things, 
And there's this contrast between what Jesus is doing and what the religious leaders of the day were doing. And this, I find this just a fascinating passage, Luke 5. And I'm just reading the, the bottom portion, three verses and four verses out of it. Jesus says, uh, speaking to the, the religious leaders, he told them this parable. No one tears out a piece of new garment to patch on an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say, the old is better. So all of you who are aged in the Lord, you just go, that's right, I'm better. <laughs> no, what, what Jesus, Jesus is drawing this contrast, right? They're, they're asking their question. It's like, how come your disciples don't do this? And basically, how come your practices don't look like the practices of everyone else? How come you're not falling in line with the way that things have always been done? And Jesus is drawing this contrast through the parable of the wineskins. He says something new, in essence, something new is happening. This isn't just continuing the religious practices of the days and moving it forward another generation and passing it in a tradition to the next generation, passing that tradition to the next generation. Jesus says the kingdom has come to you, not in this particular passage, but in others, the kingdom has come, and if you just try and take what has been and put it onto what's happening now, it's, it's ill-fitting. He's not saying that the old is bad, but the old fits best in the old wineskins. And it's really good, and it's developed, and people long for that because of how it's aged. And, and you know, I would say the same thing about those of you who have walked with Christ for many years. Maybe you've heard that there's not a place for you. Maybe you've heard that you're just, you're just waiting for Jesus to come back. Can I encourage you? People want what you have. Like you follow Jesus for enough time, you've seen enough stuff in this life, you have possibly been married, you've possibly raised kids, you've had different work environments maybe, uh, you've navigated relationships. Many of you have done that under the discipleship of Jesus and there is a refinement, a, an aging to your discipleship and to your life with Jesus that people want that. Like, they're not saying, I want the new wine, I want the, the young person who's never done this to tell me about it. They're saying, I would love to know how you navigated this thing in life. So you have life and wine to pour out into the body of Christ and into those who are discipling. So you need to hear that because you may just be thinking, like, I'm just on the shelf, I'm just waiting, like, Jesus is coming back. So my main job in this world, you may be thinking, is to critique how bad it's getting and say, Jesus has to come back tomorrow. <laughs> that, you may feel like that. You may just feel like, like, I just want it all to end because I've been walking with Jesus long enough. It hasn't been this bad before. It's getting worse, and I just want Jesus to come back. All of us together say, yes and amen, Jesus come back, right? Okay, we're all there. We're joining with you in that. But listen, your greatest gift to the body of Christ is not your critique of the culture or that, that it's really gone down the tank and that Jesus is coming back. We do know that, and we would agree with you. Your greatest gift is you have life in Jesus, wine aged life with Jesus because you've experienced it and you can pour it out into the lives of those who are coming behind you. Can I, can I just really encourage you, seasoned followers of Jesus? You've lived life, you've walked with Christ through so many, you've walked with Jesus through the death of a loved one, you've walked with Jesus through maybe the raising of children. I mean, all these scenarios that I mentioned before, you've walked with Jesus. Please, 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 don't allow that wine to just be spilled on the ground on your last days and never get to put to use for somebody. Don't take that wine and just say, well, that's going to heaven with me. It's not. It's being poured out here. Jesus will get the praise and the glory, but you have life to pour out to those around you. And it may feel like to you at times 
Well, they didn't want to hear from me. They're too busy. They got other stuff. It, listen, you ever, you ever say no to something until you try it, and then you go, oh, that was good. <laughs> I did not like avocados when I was younger, but I sure love guacamole now. <laughs> There's so many things that I didn't like, right? But when I tasted it, I just assumed I didn't like it because of the look of it, because of the way it was presented, because of so many other reasons. But when I actually tried it, I was like, oh, that's actually good. And I want to incorporate that into my life. I know I'm using a, a kind of an analogy about that, but that, that is sometimes we hear like there's not a place for us, so we push back and we just say, okay, fine. There's not a place for me. I want you to know there's a place for you here at this church family to come alongside. And even though maybe those in the generations behind you are busy and they do have stuff going on, it may take you doing the step out. And I know that doesn't seem fair because, you know, why should you have to reach out? But it may take you just saying, hey, you want to come to dinner? Can I take you to lunch after church next week? and get to know them and, and just make that connection and meet their kids, pray for their kids, uh, maybe build relationship. So this is Jesus saying, listen, after, and no one after drinking the old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. Jesus is drawing again this, this parable of the wineskins. But here's, here's what new wine has. We're saying something new is happening when it's, you don't put it in something that already has age and has restriction around it. You put it in something that is flexible, something that is, is ready to expand with the aging of, of discipleship, right? He's giving this picture of life and, and how, you know, when we're younger, we tend to roll with the punches and we're just a little more flexible with the way things are coming at us. And, and so we think about Jesus and his ministry. Jesus was new wine, to those around him. He was bringing new wine and the many of the religious leaders around him were like, we'll have none of it. Like, don't bring anything new. Just, just receive what's been given to you. And Jesus is saying, the kingdom has come. It's not going to contain it in the same wineskins that you've been preparing for people all these years. This is... His comparison for the religious leaders. You, he's just saying, you've been putting together, you've been emptying out one and then giving it back out and saying, okay, now this fills up and it's ill-fitting. So here's some of the ways that Jesus brought new wine to his, the, the people of his day, and he still does it. And he calls the unqualified. This is new wine. Like if you were going to be following a rabbi in, in the time of Jesus, you had to meet certain qualifications. You couldn't just say, hey, I like what that Jesus guy is teaching. I'm going to just start following him. There's a reason that Jesus had to call the disciples to himself and said, come follow me. The way it worked wasn't that you just picked a preacher and just said, oh, I, I like their messages. I think I'll start going there. It was they saw Jesus and his way of life and his way of teaching and they were mesmerized, captivated. And so we wonder sometimes, why did they just drop their nets and follow? Like, that seems weird. How many of you would just, you, you see somebody that you admire their life and their teaching, and you just go, yeah, I'm going to leave behind everything and just start following them and following their life. It's different for us. I get it. But this was still a huge commitment for them to drop their nets or for Matthew to leave tax collecting and to start following Jesus. The reason they did is because the way that it was practiced in that day, if there was a rabbi, he would invite you to follow in his way, and that was an incredible privilege. That wasn't no small thing. That was only a few people got to follow a rabbi, and potentially they themselves become rabbis who would then have followers as well. That's the very thing that Jesus did. Come follow me. And the people he called tax collector, fisherman. In fact, in the book of Acts, it says, they took note, they being others who were observing the disciples, they took note, particularly of Peter, I think it was John, and they took note that these were men who were ordinary. Nothing special about them. But they had been with Jesus. That's what they took note of. So Jesus 
new wine is coming, he calls the unqualified. He begins to make friendship. He, he makes friends with the unacceptable. Those who are outcasts within the culture. That was commonly accused, an accusation against Jesus. He's friends with sinners and tax collectors. The, the riffraff of the culture. New wine. New wine for the kingdom. It's not the insiders who get to be included. It's the outsiders who want to be part of the kingdom. Jesus flips, turns the tables and, and flips the, the, norm, the norms and the rules of the day. Jesus puts emphasis on inclusion over tradition. What I mean by this is, like, if you were included, if you followed the rules, if you were part of the tradition, if you obeyed all of the, the way things were written out and you were supposed to follow, you got to be included. But Jesus looked at those and he would look at a Roman centurion and say, this, this guy here, because he has great faith, he is incredibly close to the kingdom right here. I've never seen this type of faith in, in all of Israel. Says the same thing about a, a, a woman who's not Jewish. She's an outsider. And Jesus says, she's a lot closer than a lot of you that think you're insiders. She's a lot closer to the kingdom than many of you. So the outsiders become insiders. He puts this emphasis on including people instead of the walls that you have to obey, otherwise you're on the, the outside. In fact, those who thought they were on the inside, right? Jesus repeatedly said, actually, you're blind. You don't have sight. <laughs> and you're the one who is struggling. You're the one who's on the outside. Others who are humble and take the low seat and who are pleading and asking God for mercy, they're on the inside. Yeah, this is such a great message for you and for the world around you. Have you ever felt like you're on the outside? Have you ever felt like the world can keep going on, but you're not really needed? <laughs> like you're on the outside, everybody else seems to be... I mean, this is a universal thing that happens to us as people. We often feel like we're on the outside looking in. And here's Jesus saying, listen, son or daughter, you're on the inside. You get to be part of it. You get to be included. If you just call out to me, if you just recognize your need for me, if you call out to me, you get to be on the inside. And those that are proud and arrogant and think that everything should just go their way because they have the right status, they have the, the right accolades, they, they're positioned right in life, Jesus says, they're on the outside, looking in, trying to get in. But if they'll humble themselves, they can be insiders as well. So this is new wine that Jesus is pouring out. Another one is he interprets scripture with heart overhead. What I mean by this is the letter of the law, right? This is the, the scribes, the Pharisees. You had to toe the line. In fact, they actually added in uh, laws. They added in rules that people had to go by in order to be considered included and loved by God. They, they were very much emphasized, emphasizing uh, the head and the obedience of the letter of the law. And Jesus kept introducing this idea, don't you know God desires mercy more than sacrifice? Don't you know that, that God wants you to learn how to love and forgive and provide grace? Don't you know that God would rather express his mercy to somebody than his wrath on somebody? So you have the woman who's caught in adultery, drug out in front, and they say, the letter of the law says this woman caught in adultery should be put to death by stoning. What do you say, Rabbi? What do you say? And Jesus says, let's play the game. <laughs> Whoever of you is without sin, you throw the first stone. Right? A couple things happen. All of a sudden there's this recognition. Well, none of us are really worthy. None of us are capable of throwing that first stone because if we say we are without sin, we're lying and we're worthy of judgment for being a liar. But the other thing that happened is Jesus turns to the woman and he says, woman, where are your accusers? She says, there are none. He says, okay, 
then go and sin no more, right? What an act of grace and mercy, but also calling her, and this is the last one, calling her to a higher standard. Jesus points to a higher spirituality. It's not enough that you don't commit adultery, but if you lust for somebody in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Whoa, that's not fair. It's, it's not enough that you don't murder your brother. If you call out, you idiot, you, you fool, if you call out to them in a way of such anger that you wish ill and you just want them to be hurt verbally, is you've already committed murder in your heart. How's that fair? <laughs> he raises, while giving grace and extending love, he changes the way that we talk about what spirituality looks like because he raises the standard, right? You can no longer say and do things right up to the border of what the rule is and get away with it. Jesus says, if it's in your heart, if you want to do it, if, if the appetite is there, you better address it. Because it's already telling you the type of person that you are and the transformations that need to take place in your heart and in your mind. Right? So this is the other way. Jesus brings new wine to his listeners. He's changing the way things are talked about. He points to a higher spirituality. Well, here, here's where I'm going with this. is because in Jesus' day, people were accustomed to things happening a certain way. Many of you maybe were following Christ through the time of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and you witnessed another significant change that was happening through what we call the charismatic movement or this, the, the Jesus movement, right, of the late 60s, early 70s, and kind of what was, what was happening through there. And it, was, it was a big shift. Like, uh, if, you, if you hear some of the stories, what was happening is some folks who were coming down from, um, uh, to, coming out of environments that were not churchy at all, uh, drug uh, cultures, they were coming from uh, living kind of more nomadic lifestyles, they had broken away from the traditional homes of their parents from the previous generation, and then all of a sudden they started encountering Jesus, and they're coming to faith in Christ. And some of the stuff that was happening in the churches, people were like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, you're, you're barefoot. And you're wearing jeans. And we wear suits. <laughs> and shoes. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's kind of like, this isn't, this isn't right. And at the same time, though, they were coming to Christ. And along with the, the long hair and the bare feet and the change of dress... They were bringing in their music and they're saying, hey, I bet I can write a song that sounds a little different than the songs that they're playing on the piano and the organ in the church. I'm going to try a guitar and we're going to introduce some drums. And for many folks, it was like, okay, you crossed the line. Now you're messing with our music. Right? It, was a, it, was a, it was a big change. And, and one generation, some in one generation were saying, no. And they're just like, close the doors, like, you, this to you. This is this is you don't get to be included. But it was actually new wine, right? And we look back, we can see it. We go, oh yeah, God was definitely doing a new thing, and the Holy Spirit was moving and bringing in a whole new generation of of followers of Jesus. And sometimes what we see in these transitions is their pain points, like the things that are being talked about and the way they're being talked about. It feels uncomfortable, and we want to say. Like, well, we already changed our music. And we already, like, you've got a pastor who's in jeans right now, and he doesn't have a jacket. So we've already bridged all those gaps, right? And then the next generation comes up, and you go, oh, wait. They're, the way that they're expressing faith and the way they're walking out their discipleship looks different even than what we do and what the other generation, you know, Gen X did. And it begins to get difficult and challenging. New wine, right? A new season. Jesus is doing something different. I want us to be a church 
that doesn't look at it and say, because it's different or because I don't see it the same way, there's something wrong with it. I want us to be a church that just says, listen, Jesus, you're doing something different. That doesn't mean that I need to take on a new wineskin. <laughs> listen, that'll be ill-fitting for you. What it does mean is that you listen to the next generation or the previous generation. We listen to one another. We say, okay, what was Jesus doing in your day and how did it work and how did you navigate through that? Because the Word is the same and the Spirit is the same and the Savior is the same. It's just we got to figure out because we are in a generational moment where it's changing. We've been in one, if you haven't noticed, for a little while now. And it's really the church always lag, tends to lag a little bit behind in terms of these generational moments as we try to understand what does that mean for us and how do we adjust it, adjust to it. So my encouragement is for us to be a church that welcomes new wine. And the new wine that Jesus is putting into new wineskins. And that we are next to each other, old wineskins with old wine that people want, they want to pour it out, and they want to experience that, next to new wineskins and new wine where Jesus is working and, and we get to experience it and celebrate it together, amen? amen? This is building our house together. This is individually, but also together as a church family, we work on this together. In this way, listen, building this house of faith individually and in community requires us to see ourselves and others as practitioners. God's not done with you yet. And I know you understand that, but that means you're still discipling. You're still learning. In fact, we will always be discovering, always amazed, and always becoming more alive than Jesus. We're always learning something new. It doesn't matter if you're from one generation or the next. You're continually growing. This is the way of life in Jesus, right? The scriptures opened up to you, and all of a sudden you go, I've never read that before. This is amazing. And I, I know enough of you who have walked with Jesus for a length of time, you're like this. This is why I'm preaching this, is because I'm preaching the choir. I know that. You're on board with it. You want, let's go. Let's see from one generation to the next. But what it's going to take, this is the challenging part, is not making decisions or judgments about one generation to the next, back and forth. It's going to take us standing shoulder to shoulder, building this together. Saying, I'm with them. I'm with them. And I don't have to make them small in order to make me feel big. I want to acknowledge God's work in them, and I want to celebrate what it is God's doing in the next generation. And if I don't understand why it's coming out this way, or why it's expressed in this way, I'm, before I make a decision about it, I want to talk to somebody. I want to talk to somebody from the next generation. I want to understand what's meaningful about that expression of faith, what's meaningful about pursuing Jesus and discipling with Jesus in that way. And that way we can walk together. Worship team, if you'll come up. Building a life of faith that remains. Listen, I've done enough projects to know sometimes you need that other person right by your shoulder, right? Helping you, helping you with it. I've done some pretty pathetic things, like out there at Home Depot trying to get a big sheet of drywall up into my truck all by myself, you know, and some of you are like, oh, that's easy, and I'm like, no, it's not for me. As I already told you, I'm picking Advil, this is, this is pain. And, you know, trying to load stuff up, and I just, in my mind, here's what I'm thinking, I just had one person with me, sure would make this easier. You know, this, this is the way of life in the church, in the body of Christ. You're not meant to live your faith on your own. You're meant to be part of a church family, part of the body. Because you have something to give and you have something you need to receive as well. And we need to do this together. Over the coming weeks, starting with the parables of the kingdom, we're going to talk about what it is that Jesus is inviting us to and the invitation to grow up and to become stronger in our faith and building up of our faith with Jesus. To understand when Jesus went about says preaching the kingdom of God. What is that invitation? What 
What is it that we're joining into when he says, come follow me? How does Jesus liken the kingdom to certain things? And what is supposed to be our response when we're presented with the kingdom? How does Jesus say that we should respond when the invitation to be a part of the kingdom comes about? Would you join me in standing? We're just going to finish, if we can just go through the course of um, when you walk into the room and then we'll transition to our closing song. But it's just that invitation to pursue Jesus. The, the words like, we love you. Like, we can't get enough. This would be our heart. Lord, we want you. Like, we, we can't live without you. That we would be that type of people. Those, those people who would just say, Lord, we don't want to just function with a church to show up next Sunday to, and then next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and have a tradition of going to church and, and learning stuff, and then just kind of move the calendar forward. Jesus, we want to live in the fullness of the new wine that you are pouring out, both in this space and all over, Lord, as a new move of your spirit moves through our church, through this valley, and in fact, all around the world where the Spirit of God is at work. We don't want to miss it. We want to step into it and receive all that you want to give to us. So let's go through this uh, next chorus, sing out, and just have a time of response and be able to say, Lord, position my heart. Position my heart in a way where I'm not defensive, but I'm just allowing you to pour me out to those around me who need you. Lord, help me not be judgmental from one generation to the next, either forward-looking or backward-looking. Help me just to be open with you and just say, Lord, you're doing something and you want to do something in every generation. Whatever you're doing this moment, help me to join in and receive it. Lord, this is our response to you. You have something special that you're doing for every generation. So Lord, help us who have old wine God, we need some experience to be poured out. Help us not to hold it tight, but to just embrace relationship from one generation to the next. Lord, if we're, we're just now following and we have a lot of ex experiences that we're walking through, we have questions, Lord, help us to be humble, to be willing to listen to those around us and also share our own experience of what it's like to disciple in, in this culture, in this life as it is now. And above all of it, we would just ask your spirit be poured out, new wine, fresh wine. Lord, that we would be receptive to the work that you're doing, the work of your spirit in this day, in this moment, in your church. We thank you for it, Jesus. Amen.